what's going on here? What's De what's Descartes going to get at? So so Descartes is coming into this the school of thought uh, is sort of the birth of sort of the more epistemic style of thinking, the more epistemic concerns. You know, so uh, he, he's starting to wonder about. Uh, he has this problem where he goes, if someone can doubt something that injects a however infinitesimal problem where he's uncomfortable with the, with the idea that things could uh, logically be incorrect that, or sorry, that, that things that are, it's, if it's conceivable that something is wrong, he, he's not comfortable with that. He wants to know if there's anything where it's inconceivable that it's wrong. Um, you know, that, that's his big concern is he's, he's saying, so even things that are very obvious that you can't really doubt without being foolish, right? Like, uh, like we talk about this Aristotle, right? Like the existence of things, you just sort of look stupid if you doubt that, because th there's no way you can really live in that reality. It, it's very foolish. It doesn't make any sense. But Descartes is taking it a step further or step, I should say, a step back, right? He's saying, if you even can doubt it, I'm not comfortable now, right? A sort of radical skepticism. And so in the meditations, his, his, his journey is that he's going to go, he's going to start with real life, right? And he's going to start saying, he's going to start having his, uh, people call it the method of doubt, right? He's going to start doubting things. And if it's conceivable that he could doubt something, right? If it's conceivable, if it's logically conceivable that it could be wrong, then he's going to throw it out and say, I'm just not going to trust it. And he sort of opens up with saying, uh, you know, this is sort of inspired by the senses, that you notice the senses can be incorrect. The senses can mislead you, right? With like, and he talks about like, you know, like a stick being stuck in water and it looks bent. Like, obviously, it's not actually bent, but that's what your senses perceive. So maybe the senses aren't totally infallible. Maybe you can, you know, be wrong about things. And so he starts saying, you know, he starts going down the list. Let's start doubting things. And if it's conceivable that it's wrong, then I'm just going to throw it out. And his goal is he wants to see if he can find things that you just can't doubt, that the, that the doubt itself doesn't work. It's not logically conceivable otherwise. And so he starts going down the list, right? He goes to the senses, and then he starts working down into abstracts. Uh, he has some hesitation about mathematical realities. And the reason for this is because they're clear and distinct realities. Now, this is important because he's going to throw them out now, but he's going to come back to this. This is going to be a, this is a huge idea he has. This is one of his key ideas. He calls it clear and distinct. Um, in a sense, he's just sort of rediscovering Aristotle's sort of inspiration that, you know, it's a dog because it's, it's, you have the dog form in your head. It's, it's and Descartes describes it as clear and distinct. And I think that's a great way to describe it. So, he throws out the mathematical stuff too. He's like, you know what? Uh, it's possible that every because mathematics is is sort of he's pulled from the being of things, right? If if every if everything in reality is wrong, then maybe even these universal truths that I think I have clear and distinctly, maybe even those are wrong, right? And this is where you get the term Descartes' demon because he has this concept of what if a powerful demon has he doesn't use these terms, but what if a powerful demon has basically put me in the matrix? where he, it's just created this whole reality just to, just to confound me. So he goes, we have to throw it out. We have to throw it out. We can't trust it. And he spends some time thinking about this, saying, well, what's left, right? What's left in reality that, that I can't doubt? And this is where he, he, the first time he runs into it, he, he runs into the famous, um, you know, he, he runs into the famous, uh, everybody talking about, right, I think therefore I am. He doesn't say it yet. It's not there yet, right? Uh, that comes way later. Like that famous phrase comes way later. But um, this is where he first starts realizing, wait a minute. He's like, if I can't trust anything, I'm already down to, I basically can't trust anything, not even these abstract universals. What if I can't even trust that I actually exist? But he has this great line where he says, um, I, I don't remember how it's phrased, but it's something like it's translated as, the, the translation I read, it was, it was very poetic. It was, no sooner do I doubt then I realize that like I'm doubting or something like that. Like, like basically the moment you doubt you you're affirming that you exist. There's no possible way to, to actually doubt that you exist because even in the doubting you doubting is 
defeating the concept of you doubting you exist. It's just not possible. It's not logically possible to actually doubt that you exist because implied in the doubting is, is the you doing it. And this is actually funny because this is pair. This is super important for his philosophy. He immediately makes the recognition that he goes, well, what else can't I doubt? And he goes, there is something else that I can't doubt that because by its nature is beyond me having thought it. And it's the existence of God. And this is, this is the big thing for him. This is the crux of his philosophy. It's, it's, uh, it's funny that uh, the him not doubting himself is the part that um, everybody remembers, but they don't remember literally the next sentence, which is this conclusion that there really are only two things you can't doubt. It's not logically conceivable to doubt these two things, which is the ex your existence and the existence of God. And the way he explains it, it's really amazing because I, I've, when you walk people through the drama, it's really compelling because he, he doesn't offer like a, a syllogistic proof or anything. What he offers is this idea that he wrestles with, which is how did I conceive of God? Like, how did I come up with God? And, he, and he's not talking about like the, like the pagan, you know, deities kind of idea. He's talking about how did I come up with this idea of a being greater than all of existence who creates existence and is greater than e any conception of God. So I can't actually know everything about God's existence. God's greater than my intellect. But where did that idea come from? I can't have, I can't have thought up this idea. It's just not possible. Like it's greater than my intellect. So wherever it came from, it didn't come from me. But then, he, but then, of course, we universalize this. What human could have ever thought that idea up? None of them. And so now he goes, this is where it, it dawned on him. The existence of God is a truth that you know. And he, he used this analogy of as though it's a voice that's whispered from behind your ear. You just, you can't doubt the existence of God. Because doubting the existence of God, you're no longer thinking of God. You're thinking of something less, less, less less you know transcendent less great than than the total than the totality of god and once you realize that you suddenly realize i found it these are two things that it's not even possible to doubt because you can't you can doubt these other things and even if you look foolish right like oh i don't think dogs exist it's like well you, you just kind of look like an idiot but it's logically conceivable right no matter how small it's conceivable that, that you are being confused. But there are two things that you just can't do that with. Your own existence in God and the existence of God. And that's where everything turns around in the meditations. He now goes, now that I've found the ultimate foundation of knowledge, that you exist and God exists, then now that i found that, let's build back up. Let's build back up to reality and this is how and then from there he starts going back and he starts deriving out uh these different parts of reality that sort of necessitate things so if you and god exist right then necessarily there are a, a multiplicity of things or beings in the universe so now you have things abstract as like numbers that numbers uh you know because because really all numbers are just combinations of the movement from zero to one, right? Because zero to one, then one to two, then two to three, three to four, et cetera. And, and then, so now that we have these sort of mathematical truths, we have metaphysics back. We have metaphysics, because what metaphysics is true, we can talk about the nature of beings and stuff like that, even without a hypothetical world to derive anything from. And then we talk, get to back to the senses, and this is where he goes, well, the senses themselves, he, he never comes back to saying the senses are like, Good, good, right? The senses are always fallible, and, and, and he even, I think he argues, they're pretty fallible. Like, you, you can't trust your senses, generally. But he points out that, um, yet, where do we get knowledge from? This clear and distinct knowledge. It's pulled through the senses. And so, uh, what ends up happening, so if you conceive of a dog, right? Like, the dog, you now have this truth of a dog. But this is so even if none of the dogs you see are real, you've still pulled out from it 
this truth of, of the dog's existence. And so now we're back up to reality. Like, so, so he builds back up from this foundation into the abstract things, into the universals, as we would say, as Aristotelians, right? Um, and, and then he, uh, and, and then he gets back into, so how can I trust my senses? It's not that you can trust the senses per se, but you can trust your mind's ability to pull truth from your senses. And this is, ends up being how he slays his demon, so to speak, how he slays the, the Cartesian demon, is that he points out, even if this demon who's put me in the matrix, right, ha has made this entire reality fake, the demon still is only is because I'm pulling authentic information from my senses. The demon is still only making an illusion of true things. So even through the illusion, you're still pulling authentic, real information. And so he ironically comes to the same conclusion Aristotle does that even if you're in the matrix, it turns out it doesn't matter. Because the moral reality for Aristotle or the intellectual reality is still present, even if, you know, you're in the matrix, so to speak. And that's sort of, and then, and then he talks a lot about other stuff, but that's, that's the, that's the big, that's the big meat of the meditations. But I mean, it's, it's sort of the same essential argument is this, this idea is greater than the human mind. Where does it come from? Because the moment you, like you said, it's this idea that's greater than conception. If you doubt it, you're introducing something of your conception into it. So it's no longer God. You're no longer doubting God the moment you start doubting God. You're doubting something less that you've invented in your head. So by definition, it's logically impossible to doubt God. And it, once you explain it that way, this blows a lot of people's minds. Because for me, this is the most powerful argument for God's existence. But like nobody likes it, though. People do not like this argument. <laughs> Well, it's because so so every time you try to think about God, you're not thinking about God, right? Because God is greater than anything you can think of. So if right, right, they have they have to to doubt God, they have to invent some lesser fake things. So Ivan, that's what I'm talking about. So when you think of God, you're not thinking of God anymore. This is so, how come we have so, right. what, what we're talking Whoa. about is um, like God is supremely good and is uncomprehensible. Hence, why if you try to comprehend Him, it just doesn't work like that. Is that what you're trying? It to doesn't get? because whatever you think you're comprehending is no longer God. Yeah. So if you try to like break it, not break it down, but um, put it to like a lesser well, no, extent. Right. If you try to break um, God down. Yeah, it just it, won't you're not thinking work. of God you're not anymore. Not thinking about him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think I get it okay. now. Well, this is, and so this is why, so, so this is for just secular philosophy, right? Like, but, it, but for Christians, this is why the incarnation is so important. Because when you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. We actually can now look at God in some way. Yeah. Which so, is just impossible otherwise. Right. Because that breaks it down to something that's, you know, that it, it isn't is just image, like right? supremely um, good and is uncomprehensible to something that, you know, is comprehensible and happened and is true is that kind of what you're happening saying? right in front of us right yeah yeah all right because and this is why that one line of the bible is so is so important when jesus goes if you've seen me you've seen the father hmm. because previously right nobody can look at the father yeah and um and so like i said so that that's why this this proof of god's existence is so powerful because the more you think about it the more intense it becomes because once you understand, if I'm conceiving of something that's not God, you'll try to conceive of God, and the moment you do, it slips away, because you suddenly realize whatever I'm holding in my mind is not God, and, and you'll keep trying. And it's like it's like it's just something you can never catch, and that's when you suddenly realize this is why you can't even doubt God's existence, because whenever you think of God, and then try to doubt it, you realize, oh, that's not God though. I'm doubting something that's not God. And so you'll keep so even if you keep trying to doubt God, it just it slips away from you because your mind can't comprehend all of it. And so and so this is once you like meditate on it and then try it 10,000 times, it's like the utter reality of God's existence is is just right there. Like it's 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 always just out of eye shot and it, of your, it, it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, really interesting. Uh, it took me a while it to comprehend it, but I kind of see where he's getting at now, which is uh, very good. <laughs> Right. And so this is, like I said, I think people call this the, um, 
ontological argument. Mm. I think people call it. Right. Um, but 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 basically, it's like people don't like it. Like people don't think it's compelling. But when you explain it to people, like it just they can't get over it. Like they can't stop thinking about it because even like hardcore atheists, they just if they really get it, it just it's undeniable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of difficult to grasp like at first, but once you kind of do get it, it, it is quite compelling. Well, that's that's what it is because yeah. it's it's um it's really because some people have said that Descartes doesn't give a proof of God; he gives a uh, experience of God, like or it's like a joke, like like a like a, oh, yeah. like a, a, de a demonstration of God. Because now, because I, I I remember I, I gave someone this uh, over over private messages. And like three days later, he got back to me and said, he's like, I can't stop thinking about it. I was in the middle of the class and I was so distracted by uh, every time I think I think of God, it slips away. And I realize I can't logically doubt God. And it was like, but it was like, like ruining their life because they couldn't stop thinking about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and it's sort of the power, po that's, and that's sort of the power of it is that. It's, I'm not offering you a logical proof of God so much as I'm giving you these set of ideas and you're just going to think about them and then you're going to be like, I can't disprove it. Like, I'm living it right now. <laughs> but it's uh, interesting. Uh, when I went ahead and looked up, like, um, YouTube videos on Descartes and stuff, um, I only really got uh, information about um, the I think, therefore I am and, like, um, the the so-called demon which goes ahead and the matrix and stuff right um but it's, there, it's there's never anything about like um what he talks about god and how he got to that even though it's like <laughs> the, right pretty which much is like right next to each other you know i mean it's kind of weird but well it's funny because it's like it's like they do it on purpose they yeah. leave because it's 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 like it's the whole i think therefore i am it, he doesn't even go really more into that like like it's just it's a really simple idea you know boom 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 he lays it out, but like, because the more important thing for him is this exam understanding of the existence of God, and then coming back to reality, like rebuilding, yeah, sure, sure knowledge of you know abstracts and mathematics, and then being, and then you know the real world and how you can trust your senses and stuff like that. I think I might have um, a theory as to why though a lot of the YouTube videos don't um, touch on. Um the his proof of god though it might be because they um generally a lot of them talk about other philosophers right and a lot of modern philosophers nowadays kind of just you know try to pretend that aristotle and stuff uh, doesn't exist because then all their arguments fall apart i think it might be something similar um with um this guy's argument with god if they try to acknowledge his existence that might be a bit a little too compelling and other things might fall apart. <laughs> Their right, YouTube channel goes right. down. <laughs> if they if they if they think about it, they God, and that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just every yeah, just just shove it under the rug, it'll be fine. He's not known for anything else, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. All he did all he did was write about I think therefore I am. Don't read the rest of it. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, cause Saint Anselm has a very similar sort of setup as well. Funny enough, um, but we can go. In, I, I don't know as much about his. Uh, I've read a little bit, but it, you know, not not. I haven't done a full breakdown of him, but yeah, no, I, I'm familiar with. He has very similar arguments, which are pretty cool, which makes sense. Everybody, uh, <laughs> it makes sense. Anyway, so yeah, so that, that's that's Descartes meditations in a nutshell. Um, I've always really liked them. Um, I, th I thought they were compelling when I first read them and thought about them. And uh, I still find them compelling. Um, <laughs> but like, it's one of those he's down the road, like if people want to study philosophy, have them read Aristotle and Plato, and, and then like work their way forward. And he's way down the road. But yeah, no, I, I've always found it. I found the meditations compelling. I, it's, it starts since I never heard of him before. Um, I thought he might have been like one of those meme f uh, modern philosophers, but he doesn't seem that bad. Right, about. right. Um, it, it's it's kind of funny because that's sort of what you run into. Because then you have people like, like people always. I don't know why, but when I was reading stuff like Spinoza wasn't that important, but for some reason, that's like modern. Like when people talk about modern philosophy, everybody wants to talk about him, even though apparently nobody believes him. I don't. I don't know. Like. <laughs> 
I think they think of it more as like a interesting like mind puzzle or whatever, maybe. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, it's modern philosophy departments are just giant jokes these days. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But anyway, that's the deal there. Did anyone have any questions? Doesn't look like it. Oh, wait. <laughs> Turn this has something. It's really funny because I think I think one of the great things about sort of a Descartes sort of writing is that um, it sort of puts to bed all the like, oh, you know, what if we live in the Matrix? That's how I know nothing's real. Like, yeah, th- it puts those people to bed because this was the exact question Descartes was wrestling with. And as far as I'm concerned, he basically power bombs it into the ground. Mm-hmm. And so it's just really funny because I know Rodan no doubt has run into these kind of people these people who just sort of they think just because you can doubt something means that you can just dis- get rid of it and it's like well no like it turns out if you think about it you can't just do that for a lot of reasons like at first you might think so but then when you think about it and you get down to the the bottom layer of foundations of, of thinking it turns out you can't do that it turns out you know you have to deal with these clear and distinct ideas you have and you can know for certain they exist because they're derived from things that are lo- – it's logically impossible to doubt them. Um, it's just not possible. And so it's just – you know, it, it's it's one of those things where it, it's um, it's weird that, De- that Descartes is sort of credited with uh, this idea of like existential confusion when I'm like – if you read his book, the whole point is he's killing that once and for all. Like he's killing yeah. it forever. <laughs> Like it's, it's just, just kind of weird. Like it's what he, he like touches on it, and then he disproves it. But no one talks about like the disproval part. <laughs> right. They just talk about like the first two and a half books where he's just like, "Oh, I'm doubting everything." Like they don't read the next three or whatever. It's just. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The real yeah, exactly the real. <laughs> Well, it's also not even finishing, like, the paragraph. Like, they just read, I think, therefore, I am, and slam the book shut before they see anymore. Yeah. Ah, that was enlightening. <laughs> slam the book shut, walk away. <laughs> 